welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 221, Rom-Coms and Christmas Stories, an interview with Terry Wilson, coming to you on Thursday, November 12th, 2020. I hope wherever you are in the world, you are having a good day, that you're as healthy as can be, taking care of yourself, you're being safe, and that you're taking advantage of a little bit of extra time in your life, hopefully, to get some extra writing done. Now, the flip side is, is that you have even less time in your life because maybe you're homeschooling again or taking care of things that generally somebody else does for you during the day, in which case... My heart goes out to you, <laughs> and I really hope that you are giving yourself uh, some grace with the goals that you have in your writing, if there's even less time than ever to work on your writing. I hope that you are taking a deep breath and giving yourself a little bit of room to just go, okay, you know what, I'll just do a little bit, or I'll just do a little bit each week rather than every day or something like that. On the other hand, if you are working from home and therefore don't have that commute and you have extra time, I hope that you are taking advantage and making yourself feel just really inspired and um, feeling full of energy for your story or coming up with a new story if you're in between. I hope that you're taking advantage of the time because, you know, at some point our life will go back to whatever the old normal was or we'll have a new normal. And you don't want to look back and say, okay, it would have been one thing if our lockdown was only for a couple of months, but eight or nine months <laughs> and I didn't take advantage of any of that time to do some extra writing. Yeah, you don't want to feel bad like that. So figure out where you are in your, in your life. Give yourself some grace, but also give yourself a little bit of a kick in the butt if you need it. And here's my kick in the butt for you if you need it. John and I are doing the best we can to get extra writing in every day because we in the, here in our region of Sweden, we are now in our first official uh, lockdown like thing. Um, so we just call it restrictions here. But it pretty much means yes, I am not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not doing anything except for getting groceries and going out to exercise outside. And even that I probably should do more of but at least I'm getting out three times a week so that's something. Um, but I am getting a ton of writing done and I'm really trying to focus on that partially as a way that I can say, you know, I'm not going to be that person who says, do what I do, but you know, or do what I, I do want to be the person <laughs> who says, do what I do, not just the one who says you should do it, but I'm not doing it. No, I'm getting a lot of writing done, which is why I want to encourage you. It can be done. I got out a book proposal to Hallmark this week. I'm working on book two of my Strays of Loon Lake series. I'm putting sticky notes all over the dining room because that's the, the part of the writing process that I'm in right now. John is doing a lot of very, very delicious cooking. So we have to be careful. We're trying to eat less because the last time that he was working at home and it looks like he's probably going to work at home through the end of the year, um, we did gain weight. And now we finally have lost most of it. And now, now we're like, okay, we can't gain it again. <laughs> So we're trying to eat less, exercise more, drink a little less alcohol, and get more writing done. And it feels good, you know, when you're getting some words done and the story's starting to come together. So if you're not at that stage yet, just keep writing until you get to that stage where you're like, oh, this is the place that I love when it's all working finally, because it will, it will get to that place. So Happy writing to you. And in the meantime, if you just need a little bit of something, something, Terry Wilson, our guest today, is definitely the person who's going to put you in the mood for writing. She's got a great personality. She's got tons of ideas and um, advice and telling you her stories about things that have happened in her life and how it's worked for her and how her writing has come together. So I think that she's going to be a great inspiration for you. And if you need just a little bit of a pep, she is a peppy person. So I know that you're going to have a good time listening to her. And at the end, be asking yourself as you listen, how can I use this kind of a tactic, this kind of a tip in my own writing, no matter what kind of genre you're writing in, even if you're not writing romantic comedies or Christmas stories, ask yourself, how does this apply to my story? Or how can I be thinking about my story in a slightly different way based on how she's talking about her stories? 
I always get excited, no matter if I'm listening to somebody talking about something totally unrelated to the kind of writing I do, there's always something. My brain goes off on these directions and I'm like, oh, I need to write this idea down before I forget it. And then go do some writing. It'll make you feel so much better about life. Okay. In the meantime, less talking from me, more talking from Terry. I hope you enjoy it. Have a great week writing. And here's the interview with Terry. Today's guest is Terry Wilson. Terry is the Publishers Weekly bestselling author behind the Hallmark Channel original movies, Unleashing Mr. Darcy, Marrying Mr. Darcy, The Art of Us, and Northern Lights of Christmas. She is also a recipient of the prestigious Rita Award for Excellence in Romantic Fiction. Terry has a major weakness for cute animals, pretty dresses, and Audrey Hepburn films, and she loves following the British royal family. Welcome, Terry. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad you're here. Me I'm too. also so glad that you you didn't mind my four times trying to do that introduction. I just can't <laughs> seem to get it right today. <laughs> no, I get it. I mean, because now there's so much going on on Zoom. I've been doing a lot of readings and stuff. And right. I mean, I have to practice reading my own books. <laughs> so right. I don't like, mess up. <laughs> it's so different than when you're typing it. And I've written bios yes. before where I'm like, that sounds great. And then I read it and I'm like, oh my gosh, no one can read that. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And then there's always that one place that you know you're going to mess up or you mess up on the rehearsal. And then when you do it for real, you know, it's coming and then, you know, you make yourself mess up. But, yeah. yeah, exactly. I do know how to say the word unleashing, but for some reason I couldn't say it in any of the times that I had to just read it. Oh, wow. Okay. So Mr. Darcy, obviously you are a Jane Austen fan. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Nice. And Audrey Hepburn fan. Big Audrey Hepburn fan. I love Audrey. Yes. Oh, man. You've got some great people in your corner there. British <laughs> royal true. family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, on your Amazon page, you have written a lot of books, woman. I know. You know, I got on Amazon Author Central this morning, which um, for people who don't know, it's like a private thing. You can look at your own stats and stuff. And I got on there this morning and I guess they have a new format. And usually it's like a little chart. This time it was a list. And I was trying to scroll to find one of my books that hasn't come out yet. And I was like scrolling and scrolling and scroll. I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, man. I was just on there a few days ago, but I wonder if it changed recently and I just didn't notice it. Of course, I, I don't have to scroll that much. I only have eight titles and all of them are in English. So I noticed you have titles in French and I don't know if there was other ones, but I saw the French ones. Yes. Well, I even Unleashing Mr. Darcy, just that one alone has come out in French, German. It's come out in an Estonian translation. Wow. It came out in India, a special edition, but it was in English. And so, um, and it came out in the UK in a special edition, also in English. But yeah, and I, some of my other books have come out in Afrikaans, which I didn't even know was oh, yeah. a language, like until right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I got the book every now and then, you know, my publisher will send me a book that's been translated and I have to Google it. I mean, that's embarrassing. I shouldn't say that. I have to Google it because I'm like, what language is this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's been, it's been educational. So that's yeah. Very cool. I love that though. That's one of my favorite things is seeing that a book has come out in another country. Yeah. Um, oh, I, and I had one in Italy this year for the first time. So oh, um, wow. that was exciting. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. You know, you got me thinking, I think that I know a couple people here in Malmö, Sweden, who are from mm -hmm. Estonia. And now I'm like, I think I need to post on Facebook. My friends who are from Estonia, do you like, um, you know, Pride and Prejudice retellings yes. or whatever? It's kind of a retelling, right? <laughs> it's a retelling of Pride and Prejudice set in the dog show world. So oh that my. is what it is. Which sounds a little crazy pants. I mean, when I had the idea for it, I thought about it for six months before I even started writing it yeah. because I thought no one is going, like, who would want to read that? I mean, who's into Jane Austen and dog shows, which was me, but, yeah. um, you know, I just didn't think that, you know, I thought it would be such a niche type audience that I wouldn't be able to sell it. And I mean, it's been my most successful project. I mean, it was my first Hallmark movie and I mean, people really like it. So, and it's near and dear to my heart. 
um, because it has my own dogs in it. Aww. And Bliss, the main the main dog character in the book, just passed away in May. Um, and so I, I um, we're going to talk about Christmas charms today, and it's dedicated to Bliss's memory. Um, but yeah, so that there's a character in the movie named Bliss, who's like the main dog in the movie, and it's just all been so surreal because it has so many real pieces of me in that story and yeah. and it's and it's just it warms my heart that everyone likes it so much and so it's been a really awesome experience oh wow yeah okay i totally want to keep on going but let's start at the beginning just give us the okay. nickel tour um how did you get started writing how did you end up publishing your first book um well i start i've always been a big reader because i was an only child when i grew up so i spent a lot of time reading I've always, I've always been a big big book lover and um my first book that i ever wrote was actually nonfiction. it was a bible study book about uh pet loss and Aww. about about what the animal what the bible says about animals yeah and at the time i was leading a bible study at my church and we were doing workbooks i was looking for a workbook that had to deal with animals in the Bible because we had a lot of animal lovers in our group because I'm a big animal lover and you know there were a lot of my friends were in there and I couldn't really find anything and I mentioned it at home one day and my son who is 29 now um, <laughs> was in junior high at the time and he said well mom if there's not one you should write it and I thought well that's nuts you know I'm not like a pastor I don't know how to write a bible study book but I mean I just started doing a lot of research and there was a lot of information in there and so um I wrote my own little workbook about it and then I started sending it out just to uh, publishers that specialize like in pet loss and the first one I sent it to bought it and it was a tiny publisher but still I was like oh my gosh I have a published book. Right. So after that, I thought, wow, maybe I could, maybe I could try and write a novel. Um, because I, like I said, I've always been a book, been a big book lover. And so that was, you know, like my ultimate dream to write a novel and have it published. And, um, at first I thought, oh, well, what I was trying to do was write like animal stories, like black beauty, something like uh -oh. that is what I had in mind. Um, I was writing a lot of short stories, entering a lot of writing contests to get feedback. And so I entered the, in, in the States here, we have the American Kennel Club, which is the national registry for purebred dogs. And they have a magazine that comes out four times a year. And I don't know if they still do this because this was a while ago, but they had a writing contest for a while. And so I entered their writing contest with a short story that I wrote. And like every, every short story that's entered just has to have a, a dog in it. That's the, the rule. So I entered this story. It was set around Valentine's day at a chocolate shop and it had a secret <laughs> admirer and a dog. And, um, so I ended up winning second place and the, the pub, the editor of the magazine called to tell me that I had won and you know, your magazine gets, you know, your, your story gets printed in the magazine if you place and there's a nice cash award. It was really exciting. Um, but she called because she wanted to chat with me <laughs> and she said, I wanted to tell you congratulations that you're, you're the second place winner, but I also wanted to talk to you and ask you if you realize that you are not writing dog fiction, you're writing romance. And I was like, well, I hadn't really thought of that. You know, she said, you're writing rom-com, you know, everyone's falling in love. The people are falling in love. The dogs are falling in love. That's what you're writing. And so, um, I mean, I don't even remember her name, but I wish I did because I would get back in touch with her and tell her thanks You know, yeah. for it's working out. So um, that's kind of when I started realizing maybe she's right. That is what I'm writing. And so I started writing a romance the very next day, which never saw the light of day because it was terrible. But the one <laughs> after that got published. So, yeah. Oh, wow. What a fabulous story. Yeah. So that's how it got, that's how it got started. Oh, nice. And so just for everybody listening, if you're reading something that, that you think the person needs to be told, like you're really good at this, just tell them. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't know them. Yes. Yeah. Because the voice in our head never says that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the voice in my head is like, well, I totally see why nobody bought that one. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So, so then you started, uh, I, I have no idea that what the date is, but as far back as I could go on Amazon was 2012. Is that when your first book came out or before that? Um, I wrote for a small press before that, um, probably 2000, you know, 2010, 2011, but my first, um, big, you know, publishing contract, get, the book came out in 2012. Yes. Nice. It, with Harlequin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then how many books do you think you probably have? I know a lot of times people are sort of guessing. <laughs> 
I'm going to guess around 35. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's 35 a <laughs> books in 10 years. That's amazing. Um, yeah. That makes me tired when you say it like that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So your new book is Christmas Charms. Tell us, yeah. how did you come up with the idea? Well, how, just tell us all about it. Tell us about the okay. story too. Well, this is Christmas Charms. I love the cover. I dressed to match it today. <laughs> oh, nice. If you're not watching on YouTube, uh, if you're listening, it's just a beautiful cover. It is a pretty cover. I love it. I love that color. Um, it's blue. <laughs> so um, Christmas Charms is a magical Christmas rom-com that I wrote for Hallmark Publishing. It's very much like a Hallmark movie in book form. And um, it's the, basically the story of a magic charm bracelet. Our heroine at the beginning of the story, Ashley, has just a not so great experience. She's supposed to be going to Paris for Christmas with her almost fiance. Um, but at the beginning, that falls through. And she ends up going home to her small town, Owl Lake, upstate New York, where she grew up. And she hasn't been back for the holidays in quite a while. And while she's on the train on the way home, she meets a woman next to her that wears a beautiful antique charm bracelet. And um, she kind of pours her heart out to the woman. And when she wakes up, the woman has left her the bracelet as a gift and says, Merry Christmas. I hope you have the Christmas of your dreams. And she tries the bracelet on and then it can't, she can't get it off. And that is when um, magical things start to happen. I forgot to say that she works in, um, actually works in New York City selling charms in a, a fancy jewelry store on Fifth Avenue that may or may not be based on Tiffany and company. (laughs) Um, So, you know, the jewelry is kind of a theme, you know, throughout the book, but the the fun starts to happen when she uh, gets this charm bracelet stuck on her arm and can't get it off. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I've been reading like mad, even when I'm like, okay, I really need to read all these ballot propositions and pros and cons, (laughs) but, but really it's my job to read this whole book before the interview. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm three quarters of the way through. Oh, yay. Uh, Yay. (laughs) So, but one of the things that I wanted to mention, um, this is definitely the first, uh, Hallmark book that, that I think I've read, not all of them, but most of the Hallmark publishing books. They've only been going for, uh, I guess we're at year three now. Um, but I think this is the first one that I've read that's first person and uh, has that kind of chiclet sound, you know, basically first person romantic comedy. So do you know whether or not you're the first person to be able to use first person <laughs> in a Hallmark book? Um, I, I'm a total Hallmark, Hallmark nerd. Like I watch all the movies and I read all the books um, yeah. because I was a big Hallmark fan before I even started working with them. Yes. So I've read all the books and this is the third one that's been written in first person. Oh, so okay. a Royal yeah, a royal Christmas Wish by Lizzie Shane, which came out last year, is written in first person. It's super cute. And um, the year before, one of the novelizations was written in first person, oh, Dater's okay. Handbook. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, right. That's it's um, the third one. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, that's the one that's based on the movie that stars Meghan Markle. Right. Um, so, and honestly, when this book got contracted, um, we hadn't talked about it, you know, and we, I, I just assumed it was going to be written in third because most of the books are, and I had planned yeah. on writing it in third person with alternating POVs. Um, but once I started writing it, I realized it needed to be in first because all the magic is happening to her. Yeah. You know, it just really felt to me like it needed, it was her story, you know, all the magic was happening to her. And even though there's definitely romance in it, um, it just seems to me the type of book that needed to be written in first. And so, and I love writing in first person. I don't get to do it very often. Um, I think I only have one other book out now already. Really? That's, yes, which is The Accidental Beauty Queen. It's written in first person. And I loved writing that book. And, and it did really well. And so I just felt like it needed to be. So I called my editor, Stacy at Hallmark. And um, I mean, I was prepared to like make my case. I had like a list of reasons, you know, I was, <laughs> I was going to have to talk her into it. And she immediately said, oh, no, I think you're right. So I was excited that, uh, that she was on board with it. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've done a great job. I'm I'm a big first person uh, fan. I like I like reading it. I like writing it. Um, you know, yeah, it's not like I like every single book written in first person, but in general, right. like I like I like the feel of it. And mm-hmm. um, and obviously, it was one of the things that I liked about your book. I know one of the because we're talking to writers. One of the mm-hmm. things that you have to ask yourself when you're choosing whether or not you're going to do first person or like third person close is. Um, 
what am, what am I going to lose? What, what will I never be able to say in this book if I only do it from the first person? So the hero and the heroine both have to have a character arc. They both need to grow. And, and so like one of the questions is, is the hero growing enough, even though it's being told in first person from the other person's point of view? And I thought you did a great job with Aiden. Oh, thank you so much. I thought you were going to ask me what was I worried about losing, and I was going—that was the exact thing I was going to say. I was worried oh. about losing um, because that is that is what my editor told me when I made the case for writing it first. She said, "Absolutely, just make sure Aiden has a very clear character arc." And so um, that was something I was very conscious of the whole time that I was writing it um, because we needed to see how Aiden changed and grew. And I just love him as a character. I yeah. really. Do. I mean, I don't know if it will ever get made into a Hallmark movie. I'm hoping that it will. Um, I mean, I already have like a mental list of actors who could be <laughs> like Aiden. So yeah. Um, yeah, he was a really fun character to write. But yes, you're right. That is one of the things. That's uh, If it's a romance, obviously, the non-POV character, that's one of the biggest concerns. You want to make sure that they still change and grow and we can see kind of what they're thinking, even though we're not in their head. And then the other thing that I worry about, and this is like a technical writer thing, I'm always worried that I'm going to have too many sentences that start with I, you know, the right. word I. Yes. so um, that's another thing that I'm really conscious about when I'm writing in first. I mean, you're obviously going to have a lot, you know, yeah. but I just make sure I don't have too many, like in a row or too many paragraphs that start with sentences that start with I. Um, so that's more of a nitpicky thing yeah. that I think about when I'm writing in first. But it's an excellent point in case anybody's listening who maybe you're trying first person for the first time, like it's definitely something you want to think like, what's another way that I can say this without the sentence starting with I, sometimes I'll start with a phrase Me like <laughs> under the moon, the Christmas tree shone like a beacon instead of, um, while I dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've done that trick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you feel like a uh, first person and, you know, maybe this book or, or not right before we got on, I saw your wrist, just hold up your wrist for people who are watching on YouTube. Oh yes. I have my charm bracelets on. Uh, a charm yeah. bracelet on each wrist. So <laughs> obviously this book is really like hitting some, some personal points for you. Do you think mm -hmm. that writing in first person made it even more like personal and rich for you? Um, that's an interesting question. And I would probably say yes. Um, because I mean, obviously, I think about what's on the page, and I go back and edit it. But when I'm writing in first, it's more of a stream of consciousness type thing. You know, it's like the running voice in my head. Yeah. And so um, I write romantic comedy, you know, or, you know, I write women's fiction romance, but it all has a romantic comedy flair. And so I just think the voice is more natural and authentic, you know, when it's, when it's written first, I think that's what, one of the reasons why it's, it's my favorite. It definitely has challenges, yeah. but uh, the voice in a story is really important to me. And so I think it sounds more like me, you know, when it's in first, but all my books have personal stuff in them. I mean, I think that um, I would get really bored <laughs> if I didn't have, you know, little pieces of me in books. So um, yes, I mean, I love Tiffany's is what, you know, obviously, because I love Audrey Hepburn Bre Breakfast at Tiffany's. So Audrey Hepburn, there's some Audrey Hepburn references in this book. And obviously the charm bracelet is really important. And I have several charm bracelets. I have a special Christmas only charm bracelet that I bought myself when this book got contracted Aww. as like a little, uh, you know, present because this was um, I mean, it took a while to get this book contracted. So it was really exciting when I did. So um, yeah, I mean, we worked on the proposal back and forth for a while with at Hallmark. So uh, yeah, so it was something to celebrate. Aww. I forgot what your question was, but yeah, there are pieces yeah. of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Whether or not you yeah. felt that it was um, even closer to you because it was first person, yes. but okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so actually you just touch on something that is a pet peeve of mine when I'm working with other writers, celebration. It's celebrating the oh. things that are, that are happening. So um, it's a long process when you're working with a traditional publisher from the time that you first send them something to the time that you uh, get the contract to the time that the book actually <laughs> is in your hand. And so you can't wait two or three years to tell yourself, yay me, it's finally here. So what are some of your, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you're going to give me answers that I want and not, oh, I don't actually celebrate that much, but what are some of the things that you do to celebrate your little victories as you go? 
Oh, I celebrate everything. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> um, I probably celebrate too much. Um, no. but, uh, yes, I mean, I do, I, I like to celebrate when I get the contract, um, especially if it's a hard one. I mean, Christmas charms, um, I mean, I have friends, you know, who are so excited that this book is out because I've been talking about it like for a couple of years. I mean, yeah. um, because from the time I got the first idea, you know, I wrote the proposal and I sent it to my editor at Hallmark. I had worked with them before. Um, but I mean, we needed to do some tweaking to the synopsis and that was a seven month process. <laughs> no, no, it was nine months. It was nine months from the time I first submitted the proposal to when I got the offer. Wow. And, and went through a lot of rounds of revisions. And um, I mean, I know, you know, I, I have a lot of author friends and I do a lot of speaking to different groups and stuff. And almost when I get the, you know, cause there comes a point in every author's life, usually when you get the R and R, you know, the request to revise and resubmit. And I know so many authors who take that as a rejection. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, especially if they've given you concrete feedback, you know, uh, we'd like to see it again. If you do this, you know, I, um, that almost makes me want it more. I see it as a challenge. I'm like, okay, okay. I get it. I'm going to, I'm going to change it. You know, <laughs> yeah. If they come back again, I'm like, nope, I got it. I mean, I kind of look at it more as a puzzle piece at that point to try yeah. and make it, um, make it be still what I had in mind, but mo fit more with what they're looking for. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of, you know, revisions on this one. So, so I had a big celebration when it got contracted <laughs> and that's when I bought myself and it kind of came at the time when we were taking a little weekend getaway to Las Vegas. And so, yeah, I did go to Tiffany's and I bought myself a really cute, um, Christmas charm bracelet. I mean, it's all Christmas, just like the charm bracelet in the book, except it does have one little Las Vegas charm on it, which is kind of quirky for a Christmas bracelet, but I was in Las Vegas when I bought it. So that's um, fun. and then I have a book coming out next year from Hallmark called once upon a Royal summer. And I was really excited, um, about that one because I've always wanted to write a Royal Hallmark project. Like that's been like my ultimate bucket list project. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, when I sold that one, I got a little necklace with a crown on it Aww. and, um, nice. Yeah. And then I have a, a book coming out next year also with source books called the Dalmatian flirtation. It's like a romantic, <laughs> it's a romantic comedy version of 101 Dalmatians. Nice. And, um, I don't think I, I didn't buy myself a treat when that got contracted because it was a long lead time. I had a lot going on, uh, contract wise. And so I didn't really start writing it until I think nine months after I signed the contract. So then when I finally got to actually write it, yeah. um, I did get a cute little coach handbag that had like a 101 Dalmatians theme on it. But, really? Uh, yes. It's really cute. I mean, if it, if my closet weren't a mess, I would go get it. And show it to you. It's, really, it's really cute. It has like a little, one of the 101 Dalmatians on it. So, um, but yeah, and I have a really good group of writer friends here locally and we always celebrate with each other, you know, um, well, maybe not so much now <laughs> because we're <laughs> mostly staying at home, yeah. but I mean, we'll go to a wine bar, you know, when one of us has big celebration news, you know, and toast each other. And now we do, you know, happy hours on zoom and, um, we plot to help each other. And then we also have little celebrations together because, you know, writing can be lovely. So I always believe in having that support group, especially other writers who understand. Yeah. So. yeah. That's great stuff. Okay. So people who are listening, remember support groups, important, <laughs> celebrating important. Yes, for and, sure. And Terry, you, you chosen some great ways to celebrate. Not only will you have these, um, these items to remember, you know, long into the future, but <laughs> My celebrations for some reason tend to revolve around food. So you probably can fit into the same genes from book to book. <laughs> you know, I used to do that, but then I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I needed to like scale it back. Yeah. So, Maybe just a little less. Yeah. It's now it's just not so good for my wallet, but you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I do, I try and celebrate, you know, not always like release day because first of all, release day is always really busy. Yeah. Um, but I try and celebrate the actual writing part because so much goes into whether or not, you know, a book sells. I want to, you know, I want to consider the book successful if I'm working on it and I'm loving it and I'm having a good time, not so much, you know, tracking the actual success of, yeah. you know, the book's journey once it's out in the world. Um, 
because obviously I do a lot to promote my books and that kind of a thing. But um, if it was a book that I really, really wanted to write and I loved it and I had a good time and it got published and people read it and loved it, I want to consider that a success, whether or not it's like a huge bestseller, you know, that kind of a thing. That's awesome. I love you. We're going to be friends. (laughs) (laughs) And also I'm just always really excited when I can get anybody to, um, not so much, like, I don't mean to say agree with me because like everybody always wants to have friends who they get along with and we all agree on everything, but, um, people, people who are listening are going to be here. She goes, she's going to start talking about neuroscience, but it's important. (laughs) It's important. Your brain responds to the things that we treat positively. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, when we do something that is a good thing, that is a part of a goal or that we want to keep on doing this good thing. Like I really know, I know that I should treat my exercise with a more positive frame of mind so that I will keep doing it (laughs) instead of, uh, I don't want to exercise. I just want to go to work and finish that scene I was on. (laughs) Uh, so you and I were talking, you know, like, what should we talk about? And honestly, romantic comedies, huge, it's a big part of what you write. So mm-hmm. what are some tips that you can offer to people, whether they're writing romantic comedy or just um, getting a little bit more romance into some other story or a little bit more comedy into some other story? What are some things that you try to keep in mind or that you've learned over the years? Oh, well, usually for me, um, everything starts with the meet cute. You know, like the, the, the meet cute is really important in romantic comedy. And the meet cute is when um, the main characters meet one another, you know, and it's supposed to be cute. <laughs> that's why it's called a meet cute. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's, you know, one of the big foundations, you know, in romantic comedy. And so I've talked, um, I give a presentation on romantic comedy that I probably should have looked at before we did this. <laughs> It's, it's all in your a, head. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since um, I gave it. Um, but you know, like if you're looking like at Christmas in Christmas Charms, um, the hero and heroine, Ashley and Aiden know each other. They were high school sweethearts. But in the very first chapter, you know, their meet cute is it's Christmas in New York. You know, Ashley's on her lunch break and she's thinking about, you know, going to Paris with her almost fiance for Christmas. She's excited. And she bumps into a guy carrying a bunch of Christmas packages, leaving FAO Schwartz and they fly everywhere and uh it's him it's Aiden her high school sweetheart who has always you know they broke up because he hated New York and never wanted to be there and so um you know that's kind of the meet cute in that one and and like we were talking about unleashing Mr. Darcy I remember I said that was Pride and Prejudice set in the dog show world so Elizabeth the um heroine is showing her dog Bliss in a dog show and the, her meet cue with Mr. Darcy is he is the judge. He's the dog show judge. And she's late to the ring and he says something really intimidated to her. And, you know, it's just, it starts off on a really bad foot, which I think I got that because at the time I was showing my own dog bliss and I was always so nervous and worried I would say something stupid. And the judges always seemed so mean. So oh. <laughs> that's why. And they weren't, they're just serious, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know. So that's what, a, that's what a meet cute is. And, and that's what I always try and keep in mind when I'm trying to write something that I want to have a rom-com flair. And the other big thing too, well, I mean, you need to have a good cast of characters, supporting characters, friends and community are really important in a rom-com. Um, but also I try and think of it in terms of visual writing, which is something I really didn't think about much until after Unleashing Mr. Darcy was adapted into a Hallmark film. Um, after that, whenever someone interviewed me, they always asked me, you know, how did have, did having one of your books made into a movie change your writing process? And I really had to think about it because at first I was like, not really. Um, but then when I thought about it, I was like, you know what? It really has. Because now when I'm writing a scene, especially if it's an important scene, um, I mean, they're all important, but you know what I mean? If yeah, it's yeah. a turning point key. type scene, yeah. right. Um, so I try and imagine what it would look like, not necessarily what the people look like, but what the scene would look like if it were visual. And I think that that has really helped my writing a lot. And I'm not just doing that because hopefully it'll be a movie. Not, it's not that. It's just, I want it to feel like a rom-com, you know, and rom- yeah. most rom-coms are movies. And so I try and think about what it would feel like. There's a scene in Christmas Charms where Ashley and Aiden are having a big argument on an icy sidewalk in front of an auto parts store. (laughs) And, um, and they all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're arguing, but then they're really attracted to each other and 
for a second there, they're thinking about kissing and then they look up and they realize that they're underneath mistletoe and they like spring apart and they both slide on the ice and fall on their backs. And it's really cute. But that's one of those moments that I was like, I could really see it, you know, when I was writing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If, if anybody watching is like, why, what is Kitty looking at? She keeps looking away. I'm looking for the quote on my other screen. Um, oh. <laughs> somebody, somebody gave you this great quote and now I, I can't find it. Um, but it was like Cosmopolitan said it reads like a Hallmark movie or something like that. Yes. Um, Christmas Charms was named one of the best romance novels of 2020 by yeah. Cosmopolitan magazine. And I think they said it's literally a Hallmark movie in book form. That was the pull quote from their um from the article. Yeah. That is such, to me, I, as somebody who um, loves stories in every form, including movies, TV shows, books, um, really good music, <laughs> I think that that would be just like the most wonderful compliment. Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. That's why it's plastered everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think even Hallmark is using that everywhere. Oh, so, um, yeah. So we really liked that quote. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, um, and if somebody just wants to add more humor, to something that's not necessarily a romantic comedy. You talked about uh, secondary characters. Mm -hmm. um, how much of that, uh, like, feel free to, to jump in at any point, but I'm also wondering, like, how much of the secondary characters do you try to make quirky or think of as having some quirky traits? And how much is just, um, like, I want them all to be nice and, and have, like, what are, what are you thinking when you're, when you're creating your first cast? Um. I mean, I don't set out to give them certain quirks. I think a lot of them end up having sort certain quirks, like the Dalmatian book that I talked about earlier. I'm in the middle of editing that. And my heroine's three best friends are three elderly women in the local retirement community. And they are all super quirky. And she, that she calls them, her brother calls them the Charlie's angels, like the OG <laughs> Charlie's angels. So um, they're really fun um, side characters to write, but she teaches senior citizen yoga, you know, which is why they're her friends. And she also, that particular character has never known her mom because she passed away when um, the, the heroine was really young. So she kind of gravitates towards older women in her life. So, um, you know, there's always a reason, but because I want the book to be like, even though, you know, that's kind of heavy, you know, I want the book to be lighthearted and fun. So I think that's where the quirkiness ends up coming in. But I mean, usually the secondary characters are there because first of all, you, I, I try and make the community where the book takes place, whether it's a big city or a small town, um, even if it's a big city, I still want it to be more of a a tiny part, a, a, like a little world in and of itself, you know, within yeah. a big city, like in, in Christmas Charms at the beginning, it starts off in New York city before she goes to Owl Lake and her little world in New York city is obviously the jewelry store. Cause that's where her best friend works. That's where her boyfriend works. Um, and they have a big you know moment there at the beginning of the story. So I think that the side characters are there for, you know, to give the, the setting, to make the setting come alive. And also as a support system for your characters. I mean, they need to have confidants and friends and those, those people that are their confidants and their friends, um, their role can change throughout the book. You know, sometimes they're there as a sounding board. Sometimes they're there as a mirror. So you can learn more about the hero or heroine through their best friends. And sometimes they're there, you know, to throw a little wrench in things. Yeah. yeah it just yeah. depends upon what part of the story you're in. Perfect. I apologize to anybody who just heard my printer go off. <laughs> oh, I didn't even hear it. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> um, so the, um, the, all of the secondary characters, I, I really have loved them in Christmas Charms. And I love the, the settings and how we go from the big city and the fact that, I mean, I've only been to New York once for like, a week for the Romance Writers of America conference. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've seen so much of Manhattan in TV shows and movies. And, <laughs> and it just felt like I could see it, which was wonderful. I loved it. Oh, yay. Um, yeah. So which, which I'm going to get on a sidetrack. When did you go to New York for RWA? Because I've been there multiple times. for. Oh, RWA. yeah. You know, and there's so many people that I talk to that I'm like, I bet we've met before. Yes, uh, yeah. I was there it would whichever year, uh, was close to 2010 or 11. I can't okay. Remember. Yeah. I went to that one. That, that yeah. was when I very first sold my first book. Yeah. And I had like the first, the first sale ribbon at that oh, conference. Nice. Yeah. Um, well, my husband is a lawyer and um, to get back to New York city at Christmas, yeah. 
my husband's an attorney and he, there's a conference he goes to every December in New York. It's the first weekend of December. Um, I don't think they're having it this year, but I mean, and we haven't gone every year, but almost every year. I mean, we've gone probably seven or eight times um, when he goes to that conference and I always go with him um, because I want to meet, you know, with my agent and my editors and stuff while I'm in town, but also just because New York city is so magical at Christmas. Yeah. I love New York city at Christmas. I just love New York city anyway. Um, but especially at Christmas. And so even though the bulk of the book takes place in a small town, I was really excited to write those opening chapters because uh, New York is so special that time of year. Yeah. Now I've only been to the Tiffany's store in Sydney, Australia, actually. And my, my piece of jewelry is from that Tiffany's store. But when I was reading it, like it didn't take me very long where I'm like, I think we're like in our imaginations, it's kind of looks like Tiffany. <laughs> yeah. It is. I mean, I'm not sure that we would be allowed to actually use their name. And so you know, I think anyone who has been to, been to Tiffany's or seen breakfast at Tiffany's or even Sweet Home Alabama, you know, will exactly. be able to recognize it as Tiffany's. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, we've, um, this is a perfect segue into the other thing that you and I were thinking about talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. It is October when we're talking. The book just came out this month. It's um, November when people are actually listening to this. It, whichever month it is for you, it is a great time to be reading Christmas books. And um, I, I have to say, especially when you're writing a Christmas book, that's one of the other things I was going to ask you about. Um, like right now, I'm... <laughs> I, I don't let my husband know, but I have Christmas music playing on Spotify so I can stay in the right frame of mind. But tell us about your experience with writing Christmas books. You've got quite a few. Yeah, I do. Actually, now that you bring it up, <laughs> I do. And I've been like all in on Christmas this year um, because Christmas Charms is my biggest release this year. Um, but I also, I have edited um, a Christmas anthology that comes out on December 1st and it's I'm doing it with 10 of my friends and we've all written Christmas rom-com novellas. And um, like I said, I'm the one who put the whole project together. And so just, I mean, I've been reading and editing all 11 stories. Right. So I wrote my novella and then I read all of their novellas and we've been promoing it. And, um, and I also have a Harlequin book coming out in December for Christmas. Oh my so goodness. Like a lot of Christmas projects. Yeah. This um, I don't know. I mean, I, everyone loves writing Christmas stories, I think, or, or all the romance authors that I know, just because, um, you know, it's the time of year where people really think about what's important, you know, and you can also like with what I like best about Christmas Charms is it's the first book that I've written that has like a little bit of magic to it. Yeah. Um, which I've always wanted to write a story with that. In fact, I did write a book that had a little bit of magic in it a few years ago and that book did come out, but they made me remove all the magic parts. So, so um, it wasn't a Christmas story though. I think that just kind of fits, you know, with Christmas, yeah. but it's a time of year where, you know, people are thinking about the important things and slowing down and appreciating um, the people in their lives and, and everyone, you know, thinking about falling in love at Christmas. I mean, it's just so, it's just so magical. So it's really fun, yeah. but um, you know, I don't listen to Christmas music when I write Christmas stories. So I don't know why. I mean, I just don't, I don't, when I write, I can't listen to music with words. I mean, can you right. listen to music? With, I either listen to classical music, music with no words, or I listen actually to a lot of French music um, oh. because the words don't distract me because I don't know right. what they Yes, yes. <laughs> you think that I would know by now because I do listen to a lot of French music when I'm writing, but it's yeah. not it's not sinking in. I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So. yeah, no, I totally understand. I, I sometimes I think, you know what, maybe I could learn Swedish better if I listen to Swedish music. And I'm like, no, I would just still not understand what they were singing. <laughs> Oh, you know, I because okay, so my husband and I have been watching a lot of um crime dramas set in Scandinavia, you know, right? Yeah, we've yeah. been watching a lot of those because they're really good, you know, and atmospheric, yeah. Um, but we've watched a lot so far, and you know, I read an article recently about someone who learned French by watching the TV, the US sitcom Friends, which is one of my favorite shows, I've seen it a million times. They watched yeah. the whole seat, the whole series in. English, you know, even though they were French and by the end they learned how to speak English. I'm like, I don't understand how that's working because you think yeah. I would know how to get by in Scandinavia <laughs> by now, but no, I think I know one Scandinavian word that I've learned. 
Well, I can teach you a few. If you come over, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll tour you around. You can tell people, talk, talk so me get. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> The one nice thing is um, the way that my mother told me um, not to say hello in a formal public way, like with adults around, she's like, mm -hmm. don't say, hey, you're supposed to say hello or good morning. Um, so, hey, mm -hmm. was one of those words that I was only allowed to say if my mom wasn't allowed, you know, <laughs> like with my friends and whatever. Um, but here, that's actually the word for hello is hey. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, oh. it probably was a real word that came to America and then somehow it lost the the fact it that people knew is. it was a real hello they say okay a lot in the in yeah. Scandinavian shows we know they say okay like a lot of times yeah <laughs> like, okay we would know that word <laughs> right 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 <laughs> okay so uh, see and I say okay all the time <laughs> all right so when you're writing um the Christmas stories a lot of times mm -hmm. it's nowhere near the time that you're thinking about baking and putting up a Christmas tree so Correct. is there anything that you're doing to kind of like keep your mind in that um magical snowy hot chocolatey kind of mood <laughs> um and you don't no, live where it snows right Oh my gosh. No, I live in San Antonio, Texas. Um, it did snow at, at, during the Christmas holidays uh, two years ago. Wow. Um, and it was crazy. It, was, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't during the Christmas holidays. It was during December. Um, it might've been three years ago. I had gone to London with one of my writer friends um, for like a little girl's trip. We were there for like five days and we came home and my son lives in Korea. He teaches English there, but he was home for like two months during this time. Um, and I was texting him, you know, while I was on the plane and he was like, it's snowing. I was like, what are you even talking about? And then I remember we landed and the plane landed because I was on the way back from London. And when I, it was night, nighttime. And when I lifted up the little window thing, there was snow all over the ground. I could not believe it. I mean, it was crazy. So no, it very rarely snows here. And by the way, that snow was gone by the next day, but it was magical <laughs> while it lasted. That's right. Remember, Here's Cameron a story. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cameron took pictures of the house and sent it to me, which was great because literally by the time I got to the airport from you know, by the, to the house from the airport, which is only 15 minutes away, it was already gone. But he had captured it for me on film. Um, so, yeah. And uh, yeah. So, no, it does not snow here. I don't know. I just, you know, everyone has that idealized version of Christmas in their mind. Yeah. And that's what I like to keep in mind when I write the Christmas books, because even if you have, and that's what, that's why I think Christmas movies and Christmas books are so popular during the holidays, because, you know, at that time of year, we're all kind of, you know, children at heart still, or we still have that idealized Christmas that we always wanted when we were a kid and whether or not we actually had it and want to get that same feeling or whether we never did have it, but we still have that same childhood Christmas dream, which actually, now that I'm saying that, is kind of like Ashley in the book. That's the yeah. theme of the book, is her getting back in touch with her Christmas childhood dream, which I didn't even plan that, it just popped into my head. But <laughs> it was awesome. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think that that's like, that's, that's why people enjoy these stories so much. And that is what I try and keep in mind when I'm writing. And, um, <clears throat> I think that snowy locations obviously are super popular for Christmas stories because, you know, that's kind of part of that childhood dream. Even yeah. if you grew up in San Antonio where I am, you always had that dream that you would wake up and it would be snowing, you know, on Christmas and you could build a snowman or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, I rarely, I don't know if I've ever gotten to write a Christmas story actually during Christmas. <laughs> it's usually during summer where it's really not Christmas at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, one thing I always try and keep in mind when I'm writing a Christmas story is, I mean, cause you know, there's so many traditional things that go well with Christmas. And of course you want those in your story because those are the, the ones that really set the mood like hot chocolate and the Christmas tree lighting and, you know, decorating the tree, you know, all those kind of things. But I always, it's always important to me to try and come up with something new and different. Like I want to come up with something in, in a story, in a Christmas, you know, Christmas story, for example, um, you know, I want something to be in there that I have not seen before, yeah, or at least that's my challenge, you know, just because I want to set it aside, you know, set it apart kind of. Yeah. And um, in Christmas charms, of course, we have the magic charm bracelet and there's a dog named Fruitcake who's super cute. But the, the main Christmas activity that I put in here that I had, don't know if I've seen um, in another Christmas movie or book was they go to a Santa skate. 
um, where they're ice skating around the pond, but it's a Santa skate because everyone who participates is dressed in a Santa suit. And that was one of the moments that I could really see, you know, like in my head, because everyone, you know, it's fun to imagine, you know, a hundred different Santas, you know, skating in a circle around the outdoor pond. So, yeah. Uh, that was the moment I picked in Christmas charms for something a little bit new and different. Well, the other thing that I noticed, and I, I don't think that, I mean, it's a small part, so hopefully you don't mind if I say it, but, oh. um, the, uh, the, um, cropping up of, of unexpected snowmen and unexpected places. I'm like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Um, yes, it has to yeah. do with the charm bracelet, but yes, there's snowmen popping up all over town and no one knows why. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> Okay. Now you've also written some books, um, that, uh, are set in Alaska. So not necessarily Christmas, but just about the exact opposite kind of like weather and, um, feel as where you live in Texas. So if writers are writing about any place that's really different from where they live. So you live in more of a, um, Oh, I actually haven't been to San Antonio, so I shouldn't assume it's like other areas of Texas that I have seen, but, um, it's warm. It's, often yes. hot. It's mm -hmm. not, not as green, drier. I mean, we can at least go along with those, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, all those things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so when you write something set in Alaska, or even if you wrote something set in the Caribbean, that's a totally different thing or the rainforest, like what are things that you're trying to keep in mind? Again, this is, you know, pretty much the same question said differently so that people listening are like, oh, right. When you're writing something different from what you're used to, like, what are some of the things that you use to try to make sure that it really feels right for somebody who has been there or who lives there? Um, okay. Well, first of all, specifically with Alaska, I've written five books set in Alaska and they were my earlier books, like from 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, and that was because I I've been to Alaska multiple times, Nice. Um, but I, you know, I'm a big dog lover as we talked about. And so I went with a friend in 2010 or 2011 for the first time we volunteered at the Iditarod trail dog sled race in Alaska. Wow. And so I loved it. I had such a good time, but I went back to you know two other years in rapid succession so for three years in a row I went and volunteered at the Iditarod trail dog sled race um, and volunteered in multiple capacities my favorite was we volunteered with the dogs you know because dogs have to drop out throughout the race it's like a one to two week race so I volunteered with the group that helped um, take care of the dogs that um, had to stop during the race and, um, and on the last time I went, I actually got to ride in one of the sleds for the whole first leg of the race for the whole wow. first day. And, um, and the musher, you know, you can, that's an opportunity that you can bid on in an auction before the race starts. And I wanted specifically to ride with a female musher because most of the mushers are men, um, like the huge overwhelming majority. There's usually only like a handful, like five females. Yeah. And so I, um, I got to ride in the sled of a musher named Sylvia Fartwangler and she is German, but she lives, Oh, I'm forgetting where she lives. I said somewhere near Scandinavia. Okay. Um, and her dogs could speak three languages. So she was giving them commands in English and in German and it was all, and it was just, it was crazy. It was, the, it was so much fun. We had a great time wow. and we're still friends on social media. Nice. So, um, yeah, so that was fun. But anyway, so I, I loved all of that whole experience. And so um, all of, you know, my first book that I came back and wrote after that was a book set at a dog sled race. Um, so, but, you know, even, even with that, you know, I obviously was there for just, you know, less than a week. So there's a lot about living in Alaska that I don't know about. And as I wrote more and more books set there, I moved on from dog sledding to other things. And, you know, things I knew nothing about. A big tip that I have for that is to read online versions of the community's newspaper. Oh, yeah. um, I do that a lot. Um, when I was writing a lot set in Alaska, there's, uh, there's a Alaska Daily News is one of their big papers. And I got a lot of ideas for scenes in my books just from reading the paper. Nice. Um, especially if it's a smaller, you know, a smaller community, you know, you really get a feel for what the community is like. And so I got a lot of cute, quirky ideas from that. But I mean, we're lucky that we have the internet so we can actually, you know, see what it looks like and we can read, you know, the paper without, you know, having to, you know, go to the library or, you know, somehow get a subscription to it. But yeah, 
And I know like in Unleashing Mr. Darcy, the, the movie Unleashing Mr. Darcy on Hallmark is set in New York, but the book is set in London, oh. uh, which is my favorite city in the world. I think I mentioned I went there recently, you know, for a girl's trip, but um, I love London. And I think when I was, I was trying to, one scene in particular, I do remember I used Google Earth like (laughs) to figure out the person's address, you know, and I was like looking around on Google earth to see, you know, what it looked like there, you know, during the day, what kind of people were on the street, you know, what was across the street, you know, and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, all those are really, you know, good ideas. Of course, I think the best way, you know, is visiting a place. I mean, a lot of my books are set in places that I've gotten to go on vacation. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> um, it's because I go somewhere and I think, oh my gosh, it'd be so fun to write a book set here. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I love that newspaper idea. I hadn't turned that one before. Yep. Nice. Well, you know, as always talking to writers, I could talk all day, <laughs> but <laughs> if anybody is on a treadmill, they probably are like, please let me go. That's <laughs> what I say all the time because I happen to listen to most of my podcasts when I'm exercising and I'm like, all right, well, I'll just walk around the block one more time because I just want to finish this. <laughs> um, I will say in case you forget to say it, um, the book that you, uh, edited that has, uh, did you, is it, I didn't, wasn't sure if you were saying 11 more stories. So 12 altogether or 11 stories total, 11 stories altogether. Okay. Mm-hmm. Christmas actually, which of course has got to be like a playoff of love actually right yes my novella definitely has a love actually theme in the, in the book not all of them do I keep saying yeah. that because I keep you know I guess I'm older than I think I am I keep running across people who've never actually seen love actually which it's one I know. of my every single Christmas movies even right? my husband yeah yes so I gasp in horror just like yeah. that when they say that um I mean we have I, mean, I don't want to rat them out but we have two authors in the anthology who've never seen it and I was just like whoa um so not all the stories in the anthology have a love actually theme but mine definitely does it's love actually meets royal romance is my story and it's super fun also written in first person oh um, nice <laughs> so and it's set in London actually now that I'm saying Perfect. that so Pro airport in London so um yeah so there's 11 stories total it comes out on December 1st and during pre-order and only during the first few days of release it's only 99 cents so, yes. Um, yeah, just tossing that out there. <laughs> and I think everybody should should go at least check it out because I, Terry, apparently have really wanted to buy this book because I bought it and then I saw it again. I was like, oh my gosh, I totally have to go buy this book. And I clicked <laughs> on it and Amazon was like, you have already purchased this book. I'm like, oh, how yeah, long that- do I have to wait? <laughs> oh, another month. <laughs> That happens to me all the time. Yeah. I mean, I really think that they should say something like, hey, genius, you already ordered this. Yes. <laughs> and honestly, I'm just so glad that they do tell me. Otherwise, I'd have four right? copies of the book. And yeah, like yeah. I do with some of my DVDs. And yeah, it's just so bad. <laughs> Well, listen, this has been so much fun and lots of helpful tips. I, I think that um, I'm one of those people who believe that you can learn from anything or anyone, even if it's not the genre that you write in, or this isn't the kind of thing that you would normally do. I even think that you can learn great stuff about writing better nonfiction by listening to people talking about fiction and vice versa. So personally, I think that um, that this is a brilliant way for people to be thinking about um, new ways of doing things that they've been doing or possibly trying something new in their writing. So thank awesome. you. Yeah. So where can people find you and all of your, you've got at least three books coming out just this year already. So where <laughs> can do. people find you? Um, I'm pretty much everywhere. (laughs) Um, And my name is spelled Terry Wilson, T-E-R-I. There's a bunch of different ways to spell it so people get confused. But um, I'm on Instagram as Terry Wilson author. Um, I'm on Twitter as Terry Wilson author, but without the O in author. And I'm on Facebook as Terry Wilson author. And my website is terrywilson.net. And if you go to terrywilson.net, it has links to all the different places, you know, where you can find me. Perfect. Instagram's my favorite because I take a lot of puppy pictures. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I have to go follow you on Instagram. Before yeah. we started talking, everybody, I, I saw our puppy behind her. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have a dog. <laughs> But it's crashed right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, if you're the person who also like um, what's it called? Like doing dog shows. Yes. Dog handler. Yeah, Yeah. I have three dogs actually, but my newest one is named Charm. I named her after the book. And um, yes, she's asleep right now at my feet. (laughs) She's asleep on top of my 10-year-old cavalier named Finn. (laughs) 
Oh, her, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah. That's another thing, you know, I was going to ask you some questions, but we were running out of time about, you know, yeah. putting pets in books, but <laughs> Next time we'll talk about that. (laughs) Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule or all the writing and marketing that you've got to be doing right now. We really appreciate your time. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. It's been really fun. 